hello and welcome back. Today I want to start talking about one of the most common pieces of circuitry present in analog electronics. Filters. Regardless of the task at hand, one form or another of filter is commonly used. Anything from a basic RC noise filter on a digital input to a highly complex multi-order microwave transmission line based structure. All implementations follow the same basic rules and principles. The exact constructive details will be different, but the basic behavior will always be the same. Today I will be looking at some of the general principles behind filters, and in future episodes I will focus on the various practical implementations. So first things first, what is a filter and what is it supposed to do? Well, the best way to understand it is in a frequency domain plot. If you send a set of signals of the same amplitude and the same phase but of different individual frequencies through a filter, at the output the frequency will always stay the same, the filter does not affect the frequency of the incoming signal, but there will be an effect observed on the amplitude and phase, and while the exact effect will be frequency dependent and filter dependent. From the point of view of effect type, filters can be split into multiple categories. Strictly analyzing the amplitude, the first few types that we have are the low pass, all frequencies below a corner frequency or corner value are unaffected, and all frequencies above this value are attenuated, and of course we have the opposing behavior, the high pass filter, where all frequencies above a certain value are unaffected, and all frequencies below are attenuated. And by combining the two base effects, we get two new behaviors. So when a high pass is followed by a low pass, a restricted interval of frequencies is left unaffected, and everything before and after is attenuated. So this is called a band pass filter. And we also have the option of a low pass followed by a high pass when a certain interval of frequencies is attenuated and while well, everything else is not. So this is called a band stop filter or a notch filter. Now all these filters have a certain effect in the phase domain as well, but there is one more special type of filter called a all pass filter, whose response will not affect the amplitude at all, so all frequencies have their amplitudes at the same value, but this type of filter will have an effect only on the phase. So we have these five basic types of filters. Now, to strictly analyze the behavior of a filter without actually using any components, you can perform a simulation in LTSpice using the available filter blocks. So if you look under components and special functions, you will find a set of second order filters for the various use cases. And once you build a circuit, you can adjust the basic parameters of these blocks, like the corner frequency, the Q factor, and the gain. Now, even when talking about a specific type of filter, say, a low pass, not all filters are created equal. So let's see what are some of the key parameters that describe the specific behavior or characteristic of a filter. So first of all, based on the amplitude, the response of a filter can be divided into three main regions. A pass band, a stop band, and an intermediate transition band. The exact separation between these regions being given by some arbitrary attenuation value. So to better understand this, first we need to look at the term of insertion loss. So this defines the difference in input and output signal power level. So the amount of signal lost when passing through the circuit. So therefore the pass band is the frequency interval in which the output of the filter is above a specific user defined value. And while the stop band is the frequency interval in which the output is below a different user defined insertion loss value and while the transition band will be whatever is left in between the two. Now, ideally, you want this transition band to be as narrow as possible, but that is sometimes easier said than done. Now, regarding the two regions of most interest, the pass and the stop band, based on the exact construction of the filter, there are two distinct behaviors that can appear. You can either have a smooth amplitude variation, a constant increase or decrease, or you can have a periodic variation, with portions of rising and falling response, called a ripple. Specifically for this second case, we have a new term appearing called a passband ripple, which is defined as the variation in response within the passband region. For the stopband region, even if there's a ripple in there, 
usually the only term of interest is the minimum attenuation or minimum insertion loss that is being achieved. Based on the exact shape of the response, filters are categorized into multiple response types. The most common terms you may have heard of being associated with this being Butterworth, Chebyshev, and Elliptic. Let's look at some of these to get a better understanding. So, I prepared a set of simulations with filters designed for the same cutoff frequency and the same order, but with different response types. So, first off, when the target is to have a maximally flat response in the passband, a Butterworth type filter is recommended. So, with this, the response has no ripple, neither in the passband or in the stop band area. But the drawback is that the transition band is not all that steep. If we, however, wish a steeper transition without increasing the filter order, one thing that you may wish to sacrifice is the passband or stop band shape. So here we have the Chebyshev and the inverse Chebyshev filters. So with the first type, the green one, we have a specific ripple in the band pass, so we have these peaks and valleys, so the response is oscillating a bit. And with the second type Chebyshev or inverse Chebyshev, we have a ripple in the stop band. So here the response goes up and down a bit. Finally, if you want an even steeper response, you can get that with an elliptic type filter. So with this filter, we have a very steep transition, but we get ripple both in the pass band and in the stop band. Now, there are other filter response types, of course, but the only one to mention at this point is the Legendre filter. So this one has a steeper response compared to the Butterworth filter. And if we zoom in a bit, we can see it does not have a ripple, but it does have a continuous variation dropping down in a few steps. Now, a filter doesn't just affect the amplitude of a signal, it also impacts its phase. And here we have two distinct terms that describe a filter's behavior, phase shift and group delay. So when analyzing the response of a filter, any filter will have an effect on the phase of the input signal observed on the output. But this is not always enough to correctly describe a filter's behavior. So for example, even a piece of transmission line, so not a filter, always has an effect on the phase. The signals arriving at the end of the line will have a phase shift based on the line's length and the frequency. Higher frequency will see a higher phase shift. So simply looking at the phase, will not give us a clear information regarding the exact filter behavior. Now, the other term associated with phase response is group delay, which is the derivative of the phase variation. So coming back to our transmission line example, the group delay will be a constant equal to the time it took for the signals of each frequency to reach the end of the line. So every single frequency has been delayed by the exact same 10 nanoseconds of time. With an actual filter, it will highlight the equivalent time it takes for each frequency to get to the output. And this will normally not be a flat line. And using group delay will usually be an easier way to compare filter response compared to the specific phase response. Coming back to the simulator, by default, we get the phase expressed in degrees, on the right side of the plot plane. So if you right click on the phase axis, you can change the expression method to be reveled or unraveled. So we can set it to only go between plus minus 180 degrees. But the other interesting thing that you can do is rather than plot phase, you can plot group delay. So this will be expressed in time units. And if we select this, we can see the delay effect of each filter on the frequency response. So just to make this a bit more clear, let's not plot the magnitude and just observe the phase. So some filters will have a larger effect, others will have a smaller effect on the total group delay. In other words, signals of certain frequencies will arrive later than others at the output of the circuit. And this brings us to the final type of filter response to consider, which is the Bezel type filter. A filter designed to have a maximally flat group delay. So if we plot this out, so right now it's in pink, and we don't plot the Chebyshev because it has a very clear response, we can observe that for the Bazel type of filter, the group delay is more or less flat, much flatter than for the other filters, except for a small glitch appearing at very high frequencies. The drawback of this filter, however, 
is the amplitude response. So it's nothing really special. The drop off is not very steep. So this filter is only special from a group delay point of view. The last thing that I want to touch on today is the Q factor. In general, you will find this term associated with components, resonators, bandwidth, and well, filters in general. Now, as a generalization, the exact Q factor of a filter will affect its response. Given a basic low pass, a filter with a high Q factor will exhibit gain peaking, while a low Q factor will show a less sharp transition. So to get the desired effect out of your filter, you don't just need a specific filter type and order and corner frequency, you also need to control the Q factor of the system. So a general expression of Q factor is related to the ratio of stored energy and escaped energy at a given frequency. Now, energy storage is done using reactive components, so your inductors and capacitors, and the escaped energy usually takes the form of heat being dissipated on the various resistive elements. When talking about Q factor and filters, it's important to remember the exact resistive elements are located in three different positions. Any realistic signal source has a non zero internal resistance, the load also has a non zero resistance. And while well, you will always have losses in the real components from which the filter itself is built. So the final Q factor, and therefore the exact response of the system, is impacted by all three of these. You will find various documentation sources where a unloaded Q is being mentioned, and this relates only to the filter, ignoring everything else. But to obtain the final response, you need to take into account all of the losses in the entire system. So, starting off from a basic example, a critically damped low pass filter with a Q factor of 0.707 and a corner frequency of 1 kHz, we can build it using the theoretical blocks as well as a discrete component implementation. Now, for the block, the response is more or less the same regardless of external components. So, in the first case, I have a 50 ohm input and output impedance, in the second case, I have a 10 ohm input and output, but there is no difference. The Q factor for the circuit was made independent of the external bits. So it really does stay more or less a constant. With the discrete component implementation, however, if we start from our reference circuit, so this was calculated to have the same 0.707 Q factor, but only when it's attached to 50 ohm input and output loads, so the two responses are the same. But now if we compare it to another circuit in which the increased energy is increased, so by using smaller resistors, we get a more damped response. We can of course go the other way, so using larger resistors, and here again the response changes, and it's important to observe that even with no output load, so this case, we still are not getting any sort of gain peaking. So the filter is impacted not just by the output load, but also by the signal source impedance. So we can get our theoretical peaking only when there is no source impedance. In this case, we are getting a very nice response peak. So this will only happen when the parallel load is infinite and the series load is zero. Final thing to remember is that even if we leave the source and load impedances the same, if we start factoring in the real life series resistances and parallel resistances, the energy loss will increase, so the Q factor will decrease. So if you look at this circuit and compare it to our reference, again we are getting a more damped response since the Q factor has decreased. In the end, filters are a complex subject, and other than the mathematical treatment of them, a big issue is putting them into real life practice. Based on the exact operating frequency, power level and desired response type, different constructive methods are needed. There is no one size fits all filter. So next time, I will start exploring some of these practical implementations. But until then, hope you enjoyed this video, and if so, there are more similar videos on my channel that you might want to check out. And if you want to be up to date with my latest releases, also consider subscribing. See you next time. Bye bye.